He's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an advertising agency strategist with over 20 years of experience. And together, we're the Brief Brothers, having an ongoing conversation about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. So Henry, I was thinking, as a creative, I've always felt that I had to have a creative brief to do the work. But more specifically, I've wondered, what's the absolute actual relevance of a single-minded proposition? And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I think, as a creative, I need to have that laser-focused thought to get me into the whole process. I want to be put into a box. I need to be into a box. I really get upset with people who say, let's think outside the box, because creatives need the restraint of a brief and a single-minded proposition to release and liberate their thinking. What do you think? Yeah, uh, so I agree. I think we might have talked about it on a previous podcast or a previous uh, talk that we've had um, about, um, I think David Ogilvy said, give me the freedom of a tightly written brief. Um, I also had a boss who used to say that advertising is like tennis. The objective isn't to hit it outside the line. It's to get as close to the line as you can without going over it. Um, so um, I think it's an interesting topic because, and I think that it's very current. The question is, what do you consider to be a unique selling proposition? And, you know, um, Rosser Reeves came up with this idea of a unique selling proposition and we have on um, creative briefs, we have different terminology where we might talk about a, uh, the single most persuasive idea or um, you know, the one thing we must communicate, um, but they're all more or less the same thing. I believe you do need uh, a unique selling proposition. The question is how unique does it really have to be? And that's the debate that people like Byron Sharp are having now, which is the old school says your product has to be truly differentiated where the new school says, you know, products are generally parody products. They're very similar in nature, um, but you can speak differently. You could have a different tonality. You could have different distinctive brand assets. So I think that a unique selling proposition is almost like a MacGuffin in a movie. That is the object which everybody is chasing, whether it's the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark or the Maltese Falcon in the movie, The Maltese Falcon, or the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. It's something that organizes the action around that object. So you need to have that thing to shoot at as a creative. Um, but just as important is how you tell that story and tell it in a very unique. Quentin Tarantino had a, has a very unique way of telling a story that makes it distinctive. So I think that both parts are, are important. Um, but what is becoming more important is making sure people don't confuse your brand with another brand. So your unique selling proposition itself, what that is, is important. But more importantly, it's how you say it. You know, one of the things that I like to do in my training is to show uh, participants in my workshops a piece of creative, a TV spot, a print ad, and ask them to see if we can figure out, based on our knowledge of branding and brands, what the single-minded proposition might be. And quite frankly, that's an easier exercise than starting from scratch when you really don't know where you're going. So my question is, how do you, as a strategist, figure out what do you how do you reduce because we both have discussed this before that a, stra a, a brief is an exercise in reduction how do you choose between one or two or three good possibilities for a single-minded proposition do you ever have more than one proposition for a brief yes um so typically um you start with the with doing your homework and that homework includes you know how long has this brand been around what have they stood for in the past? Understanding the past is, I think, a very un underrated thing that, you know, most people, it's like, if it's in the past, it's in the past. But consumers have memories, right? And they have feelings and memories about brands. So knowing where a brand has been, I always try to find um, unique selling propositions or any sort of proposition for on a brief that is 
congruent and coherent with where a brand has been before, right? It's not a 180 from where they've been. Is it true to where they've been before? And then you do all the consumer research. You find out, is it compelling? Is it differentiating? If it's not differentiating, what else can we do to make it differentiating? And that sometimes goes to the whole thing about distinctive assets. Like, can we own a sentiment, a color, a font, a, um, you know, a slogan, something that people will always identify with us and never forget. So to me, um, doing the homework really, and then I do always typically work out a short list of possible uh, unique selling propositions for my brief. And I follow your advice. I try to make them headliney and memorable because the creatives are going to remember them if they're if they're headliney. But um, they have to somehow solve that problem that you're trying to decode in in the brief. You know, I've had a couple of creatives come up to me and say, "I always look at the single-minded proposition, but sometimes the insight is even is even a bigger door or a better door or a better lens to find the solution." Did you have any thoughts on that? So. I agree. I think that sometimes it could be the insight. Sometimes it could be the target description. You never know what piece of the brief is going to be sticky in the minds of the creatives. So that's why it's a good argument for really making sure that you polish each and every section of that brief, because you don't know what's going to click in the mind. Of, and, and that's one of the things I love about this is like, I might have a vision of like, this is my brief, it's here's the target description, here's the insight, here's the single-minded proposition, here's the evidence and the supporting bullet points. And once it's in the hands and in the mind of that creative brief, there might be one word that just keeps echoing in his head. And that could be the seed that creates a brilliant idea, which is on brief because it was inspired by the brief, but it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. So I find that to be magical. So you've said to me in the past that sometimes you've briefed your, your creative team or teams and they've come back and said to you, you know, we had this alternate idea or a different idea, which we think is pretty strong, but it's not truly reflected or comes from the brief. What do you think about it? And you've often, you've said to me that sometimes you look at the work that's come you understand the thinking that it's not truly sprung from the brief, but you think it's a good idea, maybe even a better idea than you thought about. Does that happen a lot? If if, if not, how often, How do you deal with that? So it, I think it happens um, probably more frequently than people. Uh, and, and I think the mistake that brief writers, whether they're strategists or account people, um, the mistake they make is to be wedded to a strategy because that was the strategy at the beginning of the project. What I always like to do is, as I'm listening to the ideas and creatives are selling me their ideas, sometimes there's an embedded insight that I hadn't contemplated. And it was triggered somehow by the brief that I wrote, but they came back to me and, and it crystallizes in my mind something that I hadn't really seen before as I was writing the brief. And so that's my advice to brief writers is you have to be open-minded and say, you know what, that's actually a better insight or that's a better proposition, unique selling proposition than what I came up with and be humble enough to accept, hey, that's a better idea. And then you might have to move some chips around to go back to the client, sell them on the new strategy, or you come in with a creative and say, look, we were thinking about this and it led us in this unexpected direction. And we think that it's valid for X, Y, and Z reasons. And I think that most clients are open, if you have a good story about how you got there, to if, if the idea is really worth it, they're not gonna have a second thought about, oh, but the strategy was X. They'll recognize that this is actually a better idea. Yeah, this is the exciting part about creativity, but also the scary part because you don't know where it's going. I mean, that's one of the things that I loved about being a creative all those years. I got paid to sit around and come up with ideas about how to get someone's attention, but also to sell. I can't recall when I had a debate with a strategist over the a change in a strategy or a change in the nature of my thinking regarding how to translate the, the, the brief, but I, I hear exactly what you're saying. And I think it's a valid point. We gotta remember this is an organic document. It's an organic process. And it has to all be allowed to breathe and evolve even within one project. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, the most magical part of this process is 
that moment. It's not me writing the brief or briefing the creatives. It's when they come back and we're all sitting around, you know, a, a room informally and they start pitching ideas. That's the part that I'm like, oh yeah, let's hear what they, because it's somehow like I threw some seeds out there and now I'm going to see whether they grew or not or how beautiful this, these trees are going to be. And that's where the magic is to me. It's like, it, you know, it's like baking a cake, except you don't know what's going to come out of the oven. Right. All right, Henry. Good stuff. All right, Henry, we're going to take a look at a new TV spot, a Christmas spot from Amazon. Let's take a look. The star of the winter show is... Schools across the country will close by the end of the week until further notice as coronavirus reached out. Okay, so what were your first thoughts on this, uh, what is it, about a two-minute film from Amazon? Yeah, so, so uh, amazing, amazing execution. Um, I got, like, teary-eyed. Uh, you know, my stepdaughter was a ballerina um, from the age of, like, three until, you know, through the end of high school. And then uh, at college, they didn't have ballet, but she did contemporary dance. Uh, so... I kind of related to it in one sense and personally, um, but then the storytelling, brilliant. Um, and, um, you know, the execution down to the smallest detail, I found it uh, phenomenal. And there's some strategy elements that I want to talk to you about, but I want to get your take on the spot. Well, I'm afraid we agree that it was a powerful uh, piece of communication. It was a wonderful story, very emotional. I too got a little weepy, uh, you know, as the story unfolded. And it was a, a powerful narrative. Um, I love the fact that it was it was a diverse cast. We saw these, you know, African American dancers at their dance company, and then of course the performance at the end in front of a, a very appreciative audience. And I too have a little background in dance, so I know the. The, the turmoil and the toll and the sacrifices that a dancer has to make. There are so many things going on in this two minute story. I'm not even sure where to begin. I guess as a creative, what, what was most uh, relevant and, and resonated most for me was there was no product or there was only one product being focused on. It was just the, the spotlight that the, that the young man who hoped to, to get the attention of the young girl I think he had ambitions of being um, her boyfriend. Uh, there's only one product, and it's a flashlight, which was completely appropriate for the story. So I think it was wonderful that Amazon didn't pummel us with what it does, which is provide us with things, but instead uh, uh, wrapped us in the emotional 
uh, message of we're here for you. The show must go on. You could very easily envision the, a typical client feedback session where they would say, can we get more Amazon products <laughs> into the spot? Like, can the sister bring a boom box? Can, you know, um, I th the fact that they didn't do that and that the single product that is showcased as something that was bought on Amazon um, was important to the story, augmented the story, but it wasn't necessary for the story to happen. She was gonna do this show regardless. He just made mm -hmm. it better with this product. I, you know, I have to commend them for resisting the temptation to make it more about Amazon than they did. And I think that ironically, it made Amazon bigger in the yes. story by making it smaller in the story. For me, as I kind of try to retrofit the strategy and figure out in my mind strategically here, it wasn't so much about the USP um, of Amazon, which we all know is to get the stuff from the world to your home delivered, um, as much as it was the target description probably that they had to use in this brief. It's like describing what is the mindset of consumers today um, during the quarantine, during the pandemic, during these uncertain times when we're losing the rituals and the events and the interpersonal relationships that are so important, capturing that in a target description in which the creatives are gonna have empathy with the, the target. And I think we all have empathy because we're all kind of the target right now. We're all living this, this pandemic. But that is the part of, to me, I would love to see of the brief is like, how did they describe this target audience? Yeah, and I think what really resonated for me here was the emphasis on the focus on family. We're all stuck. If we're stuck, you know, living either alone or with uh, with our loved ones, that's who we see every day. And I really was touched how the what I think is the little sister kind of stepped up and came to the rescue of her older sister to make sure that the show did go on. So this spot, I mean, it has to rival like some of the Christmas spots. I think it's John Lewis, the retailer yep. in the UK that has every year they usually have a phenomenal Christmas spot. Um, uh, this one, right? Ten this years running. Ten years okay. running. They've won. They won awards for for yeah. their Christmas spots. Th this one is on that level. Um, to mm -hmm. me. Absolutely. Sure. All right, Henry. Great, right. great so, seeing you. Good, good next to uh, time. To, yeah. Till next time. Great to review another piece of creative. Yep. He's Howard Ibach. And he's Henry Gomez. And together. And together we're the Brief Brothers. We're the Brief Brothers. See you again. See ya.